Downtown Chicago. I'm sitting in this crummy bar and this broad walks up and she says, This is bonus content. And it will not affect the scheduling of your usual 3T RPG broadcasts. Hello and welcome to the 3T RPG podcast bonus episode. I am here with the amazing, the author, the celebrity guy, Eric Lamoureux, the author of Wise Guys, King of the Wild Die podcast. And also Gary. Gary, how's it going? Thanks. Thing two here, as usual. I'm hanging out with Eric and riding his coattails. I'm, uh, you know, sniffing his fame, so to speak. His fumes, his, the fames of his fumes. That's pretty much where, where I'm at here. Just following Eric. But for realsies, though, the reason that we are gathered here today is because we're going to be talking about online gaming during this time of an epidemic, apocalypse, and all of that stuff. Um, Gary and Eric both run really bloody good online games. So I thought we'd get into a discussion about how to do it, what's the best way to do it, different systems you can use, etc, etc. And uh, yeah, Gary, you're known for a lot of tabletop simulator stuff and tutorials and stuff. And Eric, obviously, you're very good at using Fantasy Grounds. So I thought we could we could have a chat about that. How does that sound? Mm. I don't know about the well-known part, but I do use Tabletop Simulator. You're well known by th- at least three people. That's a fact. Right. I know you. And everybody that knows Eric. <laughs> exactly. But, um, so let's let's get into it. So Eric, you have been running online games for how long now? Uh, about 12, 12 years. Yeah. Wow. 2008, the first time. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. So, <laughs> yeah, um, at that time there was only, there was basically only Fantasy Grounds available. There was some called, I think, Battlegrounds or system or something like that i don't know and uh yeah so that's basically why i picked up fantasy grounds but i think i think if people have never used a, a vtt a virtual tabletop and they need to switch their game to online it's probably not the easiest way to go about it right now uh, i think the easiest uh, I mean, basically, all you need is to be able to communicate with people. So I would look first for a good, reliable video conferencing or at least audio um, yeah, conferencing. Skype with, with is terrible. Your mates. Discord's pretty good. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, like you say, I know, I know a lot of people that have played like Call of Cthulhu and stuff, and they'll just have their character sheets in front of them, like in meet space. And then just play the characters over Skype or Hangouts or something like this. But um, what? So yeah. I've seen a lot of people though on the Savage Worlds group and stuff like this going on about bloody um, fantasy grounds and how to use it. And it seems like it's a bit of other than Roll Twenty, a bit of a name brand in terms of like in terms of online gaming. So if somebody did want to get into it, and although you don't recommend it fully, what are your tips and how how do you get started with fantasy grounds and things? Well, first you download it. Good point. It's a client. No, Fantasy Grounds is a client. Roll20 is web-based. That's the main difference. <clears throat> and then, yeah, you, you, you got to find some friends. You can find them on the forums or if you already have a group. Uh, the thing is, uh, someone needs a license, at least one. Uh, the, the GM needs the ultimate license, which is pricey but right now there's a big sale i believe on the um the classic version of fantasy grounds and if if the gm has that then the players don't need to have a license they can join with the demo or everybody can get a regular license for about 40 dollars usually or i think four dollars a month and with that, you you can play around with it if you want to play Call of Cthulhu or Savage Worlds. Uh, these other games, you have to purchase the also the add-on. Uh, if you just want to play D and D, Fantasy Grounds already come loaded with with D and D instead, but not not the books. So. It, it's really complicated, really. Fantasy Grounds, that's the thing. There's just so much. But to get started, you you do need a license to be able to play. Now, they just released the beta version of the Unity, which makes it easier to log in 
because uh, with the classic version, sometimes you have to mess around with your your router and your internet and make sure that your internet accepts the traffic through it. But Unity just bypasses that. There's a server that everybody logs on to, so there's no messing around with port forwarding and that kind of thing. So, I mean, you can probably tell right now that it's really complicated and Fantasy Grounds, yeah, it is complicated. I've got to be honest, it sounds like a nightmare already. I mean, one of the things that, one of the it, things it that sort of turned me off of it a little bit was I know that the GM tools, and when you play it, if you've got a good GM like yourself, like when we played all the campaigns that you've run for us, it's really easy from the player's side if you've got everything set up because obviously... You need to, the GM needs an ultimate license. Everyone else can use the free version just to be players. But then there's a lot of like behind the scenes stuff you need to do to get it looking right and and using the systems. Am I right there or, or, or am I wrong? I don't really know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a learning curve definitely, and you're not going to be able to just switch from your regular in person game and be a pro at Fantasy Grounds and be able to run it without any distractions or technical difficulties it's gonna it's gonna take a while it took me you know probably a year or two to become you know proficient with it same thing i remember i met gary because of fantasy grounds and he was the one bugging me for like a year how do you do that how you how, where do you find that or you'd go on the forums people are very very helpful in there but there is a steep learning curve till you know you're good enough that you're going to run the game with no interruption or very minor distractions. But at Gary's favorite one, Tabletop Simulator, is a lot easier, I think. It's just a bit more taxing on your machine. And obviously, you can't use a a tablet to play on it, as far as I know. So I was in a way that you could use a tablet with Fantasy Grounds, and that's, that's actually a pretty good if it, thing. If it's a Microsoft one. If oh. it's if it runs if your tablet runs with uh, Windows, you can use a tablet. But you can use a tablet for Roll Twenty, I think. But I can't really talk about Roll Twenty because I've used it maybe for an hour or two in total and <laughs> couldn't really make sense of it anyway. So I'll probably uh, fight the corner of Roll Twenty a little bit later. But you mentioned tabletop simulator. So Gary, you're you run weekly games on online. Are you using Tabletop Simulator? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, that's actually all I use now. Um, I heavily invested in Fantasy Grounds. Um, it, it's my personal recommendation that if you're going to get into one, Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds, choose Fantasy Grounds. There, there is, they say, a heavy uh, upfront cost. But y- if you look at it long term, you're going to be using this program for you know five, six years. Once you start getting into it, you're going to think it's cool. It does a lot of neat automated uh, stuff. And what not and you and if you if you look at roll 20 compared to fantasy grounds you got to pay for a subscription you can play fantasy or roll 20 for free you cannot compare free roll 20 to fantasy grounds it's not even remotely close um that said you can compare subscription to subscription roll 20 to fantasy ground but if you buy fantasy grounds outright you it's just a one time fee and uh, as opposed to roll 20 you know 5 years down the road you're still paying 10 bucks a month on roll 20 that's 500 and some odd you're looking at 600 bucks that you've spent over 5 years paying a subscription ish you know these are just throwing these numbers out there but roll 20 you've paid x amount and i believe you get more stuff out of roll 20 the only thing it doesn't have is line of sight right but that's coming with unity uh, it, so, it does but it's in beta i think I, I don't fucking know i've not used it but i know it has it in there somewhere yeah so you want to forego all of that stuff and just spend ten dollars and play on a super cool platform that will let you actually play anything you're not even limited fantasy grounds has support for savage worlds and a bunch of other stuff with its um auto uh, acing dice and and whatnot right and you've got D and you've got a few other things that you can play on there but um Tabletop Simulator is is mechanics free. It's system agnostic. It has nothing automated in the background that allows you to do anything. It's literally a 3D environment, a table in a room. It, just imagine that. That is Tabletop Simulator. On that table, however, you can drop things like hills, mountains, rocks, trees, logs, all sorts of stuff. Uh, you can import maps from the public domain. Uh, place them on your table, and you can do things as simple as just importing pogs. They're like 
ch- like chess pieces or not chess pieces, checker pieces. You know, they're just little pogs is essentially what those are called. Just a question, Gary. You said you can drop logs. Yes. Uh, there <laughs> and there it is. There, there. There it is. Yep. Thanks for taking it down to the toilet humor for me. Um, there is actually probably models of poo in the game as well, Eric. Just so you know. There's a butt that it's it's like a, a bag but in the form of a butt, and then you can pull out stuff out of the butt too. On oh, uh, top. My favorite thing. My favorite thing is the fucking um, the Shrek dice that you can get, and every time they collide with something, it goes some party. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think we used them when um, we played Munchkin on Tabletop Simulator once. And the Shrek dice, man. That if there's anything that sells TTS, it's got to be that or a butt that you can pull out dice from. The thing is, what I was going to say was that the the TTS is actually really well supported. So if you want something, you could probably find it on there. It was never designed to play role playing games. Uh, what it was designed for is to play board games and card games. So there's a poker table. Uh, if you wanted to play poker and stuff like that, there's uh, pretty much any card game that you can find. If you want to play Warhammer minis and you're into that kind of stuff, you can do that in TTS. And that is super well supported, not by the program, but by the community. You can pretty much find any Warhammer um, model somebody's converted into the game. And then by models, what I mean is an actual like 3D um piece of thing that you can grab onto with your virtual hand like a model isn't like a it's a full-on 3d like coffee cup for example you could look inside it look around it and all that kind of stuff so So you want to drink virtual coffee at your virtual table the thing is yes but how is it for playing role-playing games in that in that sense because i know obviously it's like a virtual table and you can sit there roll dice pick up miniatures make 3d maps and stuff like this but what about like your character sheets and stuff? How does that work? So, like I said, it was never designed for a role playing game, um, but you can do a thing. Um, there's there's macros and stuff. It depends how much you want to get involved with it. Mm. That this is and it's the same thing with Fantasy Grounds and Roll Twenty. This is what you do. There's a sheet that you can get in there that looks like a piece of paper. It's called PDF Import something or other. You take the PDF of your character sheet, you make an image of it, and you transpose that image into the game onto the virtual sheet. And then, depending on how well you want to get into macros and stuff, you can add plus and minuses and checkbox and different things. Hmm. My suggestion is to forego all of that. Let your players actually roll the dice on their table and let them keep their character sheets in front of them. Then you don't have to screw around with anything. But if you're playing one of the world's most notorious games, Dungeons and Dragons, you can find multiple character sheets. There's also a Savage Worlds character sheet. Um, I've created my own ICRPG character sheet. Um, and any kind of cards for Savage Worlds you can find in game, uh, dice you can find in game, all sorts of stuff. So, and but as pretty, far as character um, sheets, pretty easy to download, right? All of this stuff because it's got like a marketplace thing. Yeah, there's a, what's called a workshop. It's run by the community. You just go to the workshop and type in what you're looking for. Just put in character sheet, and it'll come up with uh, tons of them. I've even seen a Tales from the Loop character sheet. And if you want to play Genesis, I saw something really cool. That is a bowl. So you choose your dice. Uh, you make your pool and you throw your your dice pool into this bowl and this bowl actually looks at all the dice and tells you what you've got how many successes failures whatever so it makes it auto playable for you. right <laughs> yeah you don't have to do any math you just use these dice and away you go i will say this plus tabletop simulator as a voice chat integrated with the program fantasy grounds doesn't have that you you have to actually use some something else discord or whatever actually i will say this about roll 20 because you mentioned you know it's free to play on roll 20 but it is also free to gm on there but i believe that you're aware of some drawbacks to that as well gary um as far as what as far as playing on roll 20 and for free because i remember you said something about there's a limit to the amount of maps you can have or something i haven't actually hit that limit yet i haven't played enough on it but Um, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I will tell you that with a free account, you're limited to something like maybe a hundred megabits. I want to say, uh, something along those lines. And this is the other thing too. Anything that you create through, uh, through roll 20 is sort of their property. If that makes any sense, right? Right. Like you're, uh, everything that you create online is going to be stuck online and you're always going to have to access it through that with Mm. fantasy grounds being its own separate program. I have I, I use it in multiple ways. When I go to the gaming store, I take a 55-inch TV with me and my laptop. You can run multiple instances of Fantasy Grounds on the same laptop. So one of them will be the players and the others will be the GM. 
And then what I can do is I put the player's edition on my 50 inch TV and the GM's edition on my laptop. And when I want to throw up an image, I just select it from my laptop, click it and hit show and it'll pop up on the 50 inch TV. And then I've got battle maps. So there's, there's also that also anything that I create, I get to keep, I've created Starsky and Hutch uh, adventures and stuff like that. You've played American honeybee with me online. Mm-hmm. So all of that material I can take now and play at my gaming store because I don't need internet to do it. And um, I, I still get to keep it like, you know, three, four years later, I still have access to all of it. I don't have to delete any of it because I need to make room for anything. I'm not sure what the what the marker is, though, if it's 100 or... I'm not sure because I've recently started playing on Roll20, well, GMing on Roll20 um, Fallout game. And... Uh, yeah, my campaign from eight years ago is still on there, and all the maps and everything that I had, and I haven't hit any limits yet. So I don't know. I don't know how much room all of that stuff takes up, but I certainly haven't hit hit it yet. And I I think I, I actually really like Roll Twenty, and for the sole reason that, well, Eric, you said you bounced off of it because you found it a bit difficult to get to grips with, but I find it really easy to get to grips with. I mean, the first campaign I ever ran on it, we just we had our character sheets in front of us and just rolled dice and used it just as maps and minis, basically. But what I'm doing now is I've got all of the characters set up on there. When you when you launch a game, you pick you know your your character sheet, um, which one you want to use from which game, and then you can set it all up. And all you do is click a button to roll the dice. And uh, if you want to put somebody onto the map, you just drag the character sheet onto the map and it puts them on there. And it's got its own inbuilt map maker, which is pretty fucking good as well. The only thing yes. I will say is that it's it, it. There are a lot of there's a lot of guff on there. If you don't have a premium account, what it will do when you search for a specific asset, like in Fallout, I might search for a ruined building, and there are loads of really fucking good premium ones. But then the the free ones, it just searches the internet, and it's some guy's thing that he's drawn and it's like really tiny or really crap or whatever. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, but I like Roll20 a lot, man. I find it really easy to use. I will say that Savage Worlds is nowhere near as good on Roll20 as it is on Fantasy Grounds, based solely on the fact that every time you click on your fucking dice, um, you have to input the modifier, then something else, then pre- then click submit, and then the dice rolls, which is yeah. really fucking annoying. I will, I will, I'm looking at the subscription prices right now. So the, the base gives you a hundred megabytes. That's, that's probably, you know, a hundred one megabyte pictures kind of a thing, but you don't have access to dynamic lighting, which is going to be the fog of war kind of stuff. You, um, do. you don't have access to custom character sheets. Uh, API access is X'd out. I'm not sure. What, oh, that gives you the behind the scenes uh, ability to uh, do like community collections and stuff like that. Custom tools, I think is right. what API access to. Um, you can't transfer your characters from one game to another. You have to recreate them in that other game. Um, and then it says there's load screen ads. So that's the free one, which still is not bad. Like I know a lot of people play free roll 20 and it's going to get the job done if you're kind of just getting in for a one shot, but mm. campaign wise, <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the other things too, that I will say, um, if you're going to play Dungeons and Dragons, this is where Fantasy Grounds will shine. Um, you take a, an adventure like um, the Mines of Fandelver, for example, and in one of the adventures, you go to this little abandoned town and there's a dragon in the tower. As my players approached this tower, the dragon popped out. And of course, my players being the you know the nuggets that they are, they decided they were going to attack this dragon. Fantasy Grounds is built in such a way that with the dragon, when it's my turn as a game master, I can target each one of the players in range with breath weapon. I press a single button. It breathes its fire. It rolls my saving throws for each of the characters that I hit. And then it subtracts half damage for those that have been hit and full damage, or sorry, for those that passed and full damage for those that haven't. That's the kind of automation that you get Mm. with fantasy ground so it keeps track of hit points like it it rolls the damage it, it halves the damage for those that wins uh and it, it tracks everything in your character sheet there's also a party sheet function too so once you get the, the you know the loot if you get a thousand coin and you have say like four people and you can't do simple math you can you can split the coins among everybody in the party with just a click of a button Super automated background stuff in Fantasy Grounds. That's one of the things, you know, that I found a bit difficult was um, 
finding a VTT or virtual tabletop or something that was idiot proof where people it, it, you can get any any moron in there that can roll the dice that can come to the table and also play on that virtual tabletop have you found this to be a problem at all eric with fantasy <laughs> oh yeah big problem that's why I'm, <laughs> i've been uh, i don't know i'm kind of jaded a little bit with online gaming because of that because it, it works great when everybody knows what they're doing but once you've got that guy that doesn't know what he's doing uh it's going to take five ten minutes for to, for him to do a role when you could just freaking grab the dice and throw it on your table and just move on which is my my big gripe about uh vtts is that sometimes it's just it's just trying to run the game for you but to for that to happen you 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 need to know what you're doing and you need to have everything set up correctly beforehand otherwise it's just it's just a drag that's why at the top of the show i suggested that if you've never used one and you want to play online with your buddies just excuse me just grab a freaking you know vo voice over ip and <laughs> just have people roll their own dice and use their own character sheet but then again you got groups that like using maps and minis a lot and then it's going to be a bit more difficult i mean you can still share images with discord and programs like that but then you know it, it becomes a bit fiddly so it's definitely more uh involved once you start playing online it's you have to learn a different skill set for it and if, if that's the way you want it you want to go about it you have to have a really patient group a bunch of guys that are gonna commit to learning it and learning it with you and it's going to take a while but in the end it's going to pay off i think yeah, i guess for a vtt in this to the current climate that we're in what with the coronavirus and stuff it's like people are trying to find a temporary solution to playing at a table and i guess if it's going to take a while for your group to learn if you want to game in the meantime you know maybe just do the skype thing or try and find a group of more technically literate people to play your game because it, i mean the, put it this way there's one guy at our table right who we've been playing D, D for 17 weeks now we just wrapped up our sort of campaign and um he still didn't know what it meant when i said roll with advantage and i've told him every game about five <laughs> times and there was one point uh, where i told this story on another podcast but he got really shirty with me because i said okay nick roll with advantage and the that guy the guy i'm talking about went yeah but what's the advantage mate and i was like same as always mate you just roll 2d 20 take the, the higher and he was like oh okay yep yep and it's like, yeah, and <laughs> surprising absolutely nobody. When we when it came to the game uh, that we just played on Thursday, um, now we switched to online for a little bit. Um, he could, he couldn't get it working. He couldn't. And he he was saying he, he's trying to get onto roll twenty, and he's like, it's asking me for a fucking um, QR code, mate. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, nobody else had this fucking problem. How, how is this happening to you? It's just insane. <laughs> Yeah, isn't it Roll20? You sign a link and you click on the link and it takes you right to the table. It the couldn't be table. easier, Eric. It literally couldn't be easier. That's that's why I'm using it. Oh, it could be easier. I guess we could use Skype. But, I mean, you'd probably find a way to fuck that up. Drop his fucking iPad in the toilet or something. Wow. I'm looking at the pricing for Fantasy Grounds right now. And uh, if you're a dungeon master and you have a group of people that you want to, that you play with regularly, like if you're looking for a deal to do your stuff online and you're the game master, the Fantasy Grounds Ultimate right now is running at uh, $89.40. Jesus. Um, that is that is a one-shot, one-time pricing charge, unlike um, $49.99 a year. You're looking at for the plus edition Christ. for... Um, for roll 20 so you know and then you can get classic for 89 it's regularly 150 dollars, but it's a one-shot fee if you have ultimate all of your players can join your game and play with all of the features that you have that's the that's the premise of buying the ultimate one but sadly, everybody pays twenty dollars, and you got you get a group. You know, that's twenty dollars. Right. That's a night right. out drinking. And to right. be fair, nobody's going out drinking at the moment, so you may as well. And, exactly. and embarrassingly enough, um, you were like, you want to find something that's kind of idiot proof, 
and and I sort of have to embarrassingly say that tabletop simulator is kind of the the idiot proof way of playing. You, you could literally just import a map, uh, run, have your stuff at your uh, you know your your put your character sheets and your dice on your on your table in front of you, and you're in a, a virtual room using your mouse to pick things up and move them from one location to another. It, it is, is very, very intuitive of, um, because it's right. you know how it works. You know, you just use your mouse, you pick up the thing, you toss it, or you can press R to roll or whatever. But, I mean, as Eric very rightly pointed out, you don't need a fucking supercomputer to run it, but you do need something that's not from the fucking 90s because I once played a game with Eric, um, and I'll, I'll keep the names out of this, but we played a... Well, Eric ran a game of Beasts and Barbarians, and there was a guy... Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, his computer was so bad that it couldn't run the game, and and it meant that every five seconds, right, we were like, we'd moved on from this guy trying to roll, and we were doing different stuff, and he's like, oh my god, I can't, I can't figure out these. Oh, I'm having a real hard time here. Every every five minutes, and he he, was, he would like try and move it, but obviously his computer wasn't catching up, so he's trying to move his mini, and suddenly it's flying across the fucking table, and oh, it, just, <laughs> it ruined the game, man. It was so bad. Yeah, you need a computer yeah. that wasn't a piece of crap. Like you, you, if you've bought a regular gaming computer, not gaming, uh, just a regular computer in the last five years, you'll be able to play Tabletop Simulator. If your computer's yeah, yeah. five years or older, and you bought a budget computer that's five years or older, you might not be able to play it because yeah, it is three D. It uses got, a three D graphics engine. I've got a gaming laptop, and then I've got my my sort of crappy other computer that I use for stuff, and that that computer it's a budget pc and it, it runs it absolutely fine no no worries but yeah it's just it can't be an ancient fucking he's probably playing on an actual stone tablet that guy but yeah it was terrible <laughs> yeah. but um well do you guys uh as as veterans of running online and believe me i need it because i've only just started properly really um what are your tips for running games online is it is, do you feel as if there's a different diet well there obviously is a different dynamic but do you feel as if there's any specific ways you should run a game if you're playing online hell yeah railroad go eric <laughs> <laughs> well it, it depends if you're it it pays to be prepared so in that sense i agree with gary but you can also go the other way where you create and prepare a bunch of assets for your vtt and then you can go a bit more free form but the thing you have to remember is that <clears throat> when you play face to face everybody can be talking at the same time they might be three conversations <clears throat> excuse me going on at the same time mm. but when you play online there can only be one conversation going on at the same time so <clears throat> i guess it helps, I think, to have uh, video at the same time because you get visual cues from other people around the table. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's all that different from face to face in that sense where you still asking, you know, what are you doing? And I'm doing this and OK, roll that and things like that. So. Just keep it simple. I think if you keep it simple, you eliminate a lot of uh, hang-ups, um, people slowing things down, and a lot of frustration too. And yeah. Well, uh, do you ever Guess find though, it. because people are sat at their computers, I, I know for a, I know for a fact in online games I've run before, where suddenly it comes to you're describing this like really epic thing, and you're like the guy's fucking shooting at you. There's an explosion over there. This guy's head's fallen off, and then suddenly you go, okay, and you, John, what are you doing? And they go, what? Oh, was it my turn? And it's like you were definitely like looking at Facebook <laughs> or something. <laughs> well, that's that's the same thing as in person where where people are on their phone so at least I, you can see it though straight away no, that, I, I've, yeah um, i've adopted a new technique recently where if a player's on their phone i'll just go hang on hang on we'll wait until uh until so-and-so is done and then i'll just stare at them <laughs> anyway that's besides uh, the point so gary you're saying that railroading helps online games why okay let's go you ready for this let me crack my knuckles here <clears throat> Um, if you're interested in playing on Tabletop Simulator, you want to learn how to do it, check out my show. Uh, this isn't self-promotion. I have a, pod, or a YouTube channel called Murder Hobo Show. It's pretty straightforward. You can find it on YouTube, and I will show you how to run games on Tabletop Simulator. Back to my 
the reason I say roll or railroad. Um, if you look at the stuff that I do on my podcast and you see some of the intricate tables that I build and some of the cool scenes that I have, if if I don't railroad my players into those scenes that I've pre-built, then I have it's we, we could go theater of the mind and, and that a lot of times that's what we do. If I, you know, um, if we're walking around the town of New Haven, for example, that I've built, when my players go into the library, um, uh, it's called something Lords and Latte or something like that. There's a latte shop that you can go into in New Haven and, and you can read books and stuff. It's one of those. And the, he's a surfer dude, Theo the surfer dude. But I don't have it built in game. So we theater of the mind that while we look at the town of New Haven, mm. which is which is my my railroad point. So when I build my games, I usually set my games up for three scenes. And I will build those three scenes and I will sort of force my players <laughs> onto them using the quantum ogre tactic, which is they want to go left. Okay. You went left and here you end up on this scene. <laughs> you want to go right. Okay. You went right. And here you end up on this scene, but that's what I, that's how you, and in the same thing works for fantasy grounds or roll 20, you're taking the time to build cool scenes, put in maps, get the tokens, you know, set the battles up. This this kind of stuff happens in real life too. I'll tell you something awesome. When we played at Con of the Con last year, um, Eric's um, little uh, Chinese New Year scene with the dragons and mm. and stuff like that, and the in the you know that was awesome. It looked cool, but in order to get there, you sort of have to steer your players towards that as a game master. And you're yes. going to find that no matter what VTT you do, because you're taking the time to build these scenes, you need to steer your players towards these. So I say railroad and tell your players. Follow along, man. We're here to have fun and play a game. And I've built these scenes, and once we get to them, we'll do cool stuff. That's a good point, because I guess in, in that that regard, it doesn't really differ wildly from how you play on a table, because, you know, Eric, as Gary pointed out, at uh, Con of the Cobb, you built all this cool scenery, and then Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds or whatever, you spend time importing images in. I guess it helps, or it's it saves time building new shit on the fly or doing Theatre of the Mind just by, well, encouraging your players onto a scene. I get that. Yeah. What yeah, cool you can't really build stuff on the fly. In, you know what I mean? On a, on a VTT, it takes time. you got to find that image, crop it, cut it, import it, make sure it fits with your... I, I just got a, big, I got a big folder full of maps, and I handpick about 100 of them, put them in my folder on Fancy Grounds, and if, P, if the players go that way, then I'll just pull out an, another map. Oh, you guys decide to go in that castle over there. Oh, I got five castle maps. Let's just pull one out. So there, the there's fucking- ways around that too, but... That's the Man, really but you're a pro. thing about Fantasy Grounds. <laughs> like, yeah, you know how to use it, and Fantasy Grounds is awesome for that because you can slap any image down there, change the size of the grid, and it, and you're, you're you're good to go. In Roll Twenty, it's slightly more convoluted, and often when you import an image in, you just drag it in, and it will just be whatever the normal size it was. So you have to then stretch it out to be the right size of the fucking squares on Roll Twenty. It's kind of a pain in the ass, it, but it but it is doable, and it's also got drawing mm-hmm. tools on Roll Twenty if you just want to quickly draw a fucking map out. Although it would look terrible, but you can do it. And one what of the I cool really things like about, about go on, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say layers, layers on the map for Roll Twenty is is freaking sweet because you can have yep. a trap layer or hidden things, right? Hidden tokens that spring up. So I, I really like that whole like the the multiple layers of having stuff on your deal. Yeah, I, I I ran a game the other day about a prison break in in Fallout, and uh, we had uh, there's there's a really cool thing because you've got three layers in Roll Twenty. There's the the map layer, which the players can't mess with or you you can't move stuff around. Tokens layer, and then you've got the GM overlay. And so I basically instead of having the adventure sitting on my lap and and reading from it as we're playing, I just put all the notes there, and only I could see it. I mean, I don't know. If, Fantasy Grounds has something like that, but it, I th- found that to be really fucking cool. But um, on a uh, virtual tabletop, what if you've got like, because you could do the hidden area for the GMs in uh, Tabletop Simulator, but um, what if you have a player at your table that keeps putting his hand into the hidden area and pulling things out? Oh, when you meet him at person, <laughs> you flick him in the nuggets. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. You mean you? <laughs> yeah, that that was me. I'm sorry. I, 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 I get distracted easily. And once I discovered I could pull cards out, I was trying to see what monsters we were coming up against. So I started pulling, pulling cards from Gary's hidden area. 
Yes, it, the the thing is, is I could I could have solved the problem had I put the table on lockdown, which would not allow you to pick things up. In fact, my TTS or my tabletop simulator table, you'll know when you play with me has, or you'll see if you look at my videos, um, has colored areas. Um, each each one represents an area where another player can't touch a thing from a different colors pad. So there's pads you can put stuff on that nobody can. You're not allowed to touch, but my area was just hidden. I didn't have a, a, a you can't touch my stuff. So Harrison would reach into the invisible area and just randomly squeeze the object and pull his mouse back and see what he got. <laughs> so he's pulling cards and he's pulling, you know, my little icons and my my character sheets. <clears throat> the 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 one time though is um, you ended up screwing it up by grabbing one world, which messed up the entire table because it's an entirely wow. scripted modification <laughs> and so we had to reset the entire thing that um oh, I, I actually i actually did feel bad about that because it's the one time i've seen you <laughs> actually get angry and there was a point where gary just went Harrison! like this and i was like Oops, i've actually angered him you guys haven't mentioned the best feature of tabletop simulator is that you can flip the table yeah you so gotta turn you that really off straight away <laughs> no no you don't you just rewind it after you flip it you can see everything fly off the table because you you're pouting i i, I mm. do i actually do like that though when you get to the end of a session and then the gm's like okay i've turned table flipping on go mad and then you can just do it just once <laughs> just to get out of your system yeah with the but um the mod that i use for tabletop simulator called one world um it allows me to actually build entire worlds and with just the click of a button i can wow. go from sort of 3D map A to 3D map B kind of a thing. Um, but it that map actually has scripting. So if you flip the table while that's running and I go backwards in time, it messes the scripting up because it's coming from a previous save point. So so uh, what I do is if, if you want to flip the table, let me know so I can turn it off. <laughs> like I, can, I can save it and then you can flip away. <laughs> so is one world is a is a mod? Is that is that like essential to it? Because can you load in other maps and shit otherwise? Um, it's like anything. You, you roll twenty fantasy grounds at tabletop simulator are um, you, you can go as light as you want, just drag and drop a map on it, or you can go as heavy as you want. And have creatures and pre-built combats and hidden tokens and all of that kind of stuff, right? And so what One World does is it's a little mod that you can get that a guy named Tattletail built. It allows you to import the maps and it'll create a link. So you have your 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 world map would be your top layer. Um, let's take um, Richard Wilcox's Saga of the Goblin Horde. He's got a world map, and then on that map you could. Um, create a second map that would be like the goblin caves, for example, and mm -hmm. you know where they're at. So you create the goblin caves, you save it, it pops out a little link and you go back to the main top level and you put the little link to the goblin caves over where the goblin caves are on the top map. So you, you know what I mean? It's a top down process mm -hmm. that you can build or dive into the world with in my, which I'm going to be doing this week is a, I think my video this week is going to show you the world of new Haven that I've been playing on and um, how everything links from place to place. I have the town of New Haven, which uh, you get to from the world of um, Alfheim. New Haven's a little town up on top. Uh, you click on that, it takes you to the city. Um, inside the city, you can go to a tavern and it's it, or it'll build a 3D tavern and stuff like that. And you can go to other places inside the city. I'm putting in a building a lumber mill and a brothel for a couple of my players inside the game right now because that's part of what they're doing. There's an old farm. There's the adventures that we go to, like the, the dungeons, the caves. Um, there's a druidic temple that I just built, and my current game is now taking place in a hidden druidic monastery underneath the uh, the ground in this in this druidic temple place. So, like each each link just clicks you to the next scene. So it, it makes it easy to get around and organize your world mm. and have your world make sense as a game master. You know where to find things and shit you like can that. Do that pretty easy on Roll Twenty as well with the. Uh pages thing that you can do so each each segment of your game is separated into pages so i've got one that's the world map and i'm using the fog of war tool so when the players were playing fallout when the players sort of um adventure through i'll reveal areas that they can see and all of this stuff and one of the cool things is you can put the players on a certain map while you're editing another and the other day when we did the prison break thing somebody got hold of this like power armor suit thing and 
um, I had a chase set up for later on where they were ch- uh, being chased through the w- wasteland and cars. And fucking, um, yeah, my Nick, my co-host, he got um, he got this mech suit. And so he was running along beside the car extremely fast. And so all I did was, while they weren't even looking at the map, I just put a little mech mini that I found online and whacked it in there, which is pretty awesome. I like Roll20, if you can't tell. But I don't know if it's mm-hmm. I don't know if it's it's easy. It's definitely not idiot proof. But I think we've been uh, we've been running for about forty minutes here. So let's kind of wrap up here with Eric. Your your number one tip. If people people are just getting into playing online, you would say just get onto some sort of voice chat thing. Yeah, start with that and see uh, if you feel like you miss having maps and minis that theater of the mind isn't your thing then start start trying out any of the major vtts have free trials so you can try them out and see see which one better works best for you and then you can upgrade and start uh, investing time and effort into learning them in the long run it pays off to learn them but if you're only going to do this you know, while the quarantine and social distancing goes on, then, you know, maybe you don't want that time investment. So just just keep it simple. As long as you can communicate with people around the table, you can adapt. You can you can still have a good time. And, and also another another point to that is that um, if you do end up using Skype, you can use screen sharing to show images and maps and things like this. I mean, you won't be able to move minis around, but it's it's a it's a solution. Uh, doesn't Skype or uh, Discord have a whiteboard as well? It, it has that feature, doesn't it? One of them does. I'm sure. I'm sure Skype does. And one of my favorite campaigns I ever played, we played basically using a whiteboard feature and used that for minis and stuff. There are whiteboards online that you can use. Uh, mm. Google has something called the Sketchpad that you can use and if you put that in a google drive and you share it with people they can still see it so it's not always very elegant but it's free and it's wor- it works so yeah and it's something i guess most people would be able to figure out as well yeah and depending on your level of investment you know if, if this is you know, right now we're going to have a lot of free time we're going to be locked indoors so now is a great time to sit down and maybe learn one of these things maybe you start running some online games uh, a little more frequently and broadening your horizons kind of a thing. Um, if you're going to do that, and it, it, it just, uh, it, everything depends on what you like. Like Roll20 has an aesthetic. Fantasy Grounds has an aesthetic. And so does Tabletop Simulator. You know, they're sort of all different in their own right. Um, if this is, like Eric said, just going to be a thing that you do while we're in lockdown, he and and you don't want to take the time to learn any of this stuff, I would, exa- I would 100% say go that way, man. Skype whatever but it, but if now is the time to get into a thing and you want to try them out just sign up for the monthly subscriptions you don't have to spend 90 bucks on fantasy grounds you can spend 9.99 you know 20 bucks lets you full-on try all the features of roll 20 and all the features of fantasy grounds mm. or you could spend 10 bucks if i think i think tabletop simulator is on sale right now and it's a one-shot fee that's it you pay 10 bucks if you get it on sale it's 20 bucks normally and you own it for life and yeah, no I, I got mine around. for ten dollars. Well, actually, somebody bought it for me. But me too. Uh, so good. Uh, out of all of them, I like I said before, man. I think that I think Eric's Skype thing is the easiest, but TTS I think would be the second if you've got a computer that can play it. Which you don't need a powerful computer, but you know you, you can't be running on a three legged gerbil to, to power your PC kind of a thing. Well, um, <laughs> if if you're worried as well, you know, dear listener, that the um, Skype solution uh, might not be fun. I would check out on the Wild Die podcast, which is Eric and Gary's podcast. It was a campaign, uh, well, uh, not a campaign, but a, an adventure, three-part adventure that we ran on there um, that was GM'd entirely over Skype. And we had a good laugh on it um, called Kings of Convenience. Oh, awesome. Yeah, and uh, the GM was <laughs> really fucking good for that campaign as well. I don't know who it was, but it's probably yep. just some handsome sexy man. <laughs> uh, some douche. We kicked off the show because he's an asshole. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that there and let people believe that. That's fine. Uh, right on. Yeah, that's that's my recommendation, man. If you're just if you're just doing this for for shits and giggles while we're quarantined. Go with Skype if you want to. If now's the time to learn Fantasy Grounds or Roll Twenty, I would I would say Fantasy Grounds. 
Yeah. I, I think you get the big, the biggest bang out of your buck for Fantasy Grounds, and Fantasy Grounds is switching over to Unity. Unity has a cool feature where you have auto tokens uh, that will have built-in fog of war. So you just click it down, and it auto knows how the fog of war works on that piece because they're switching over to... And what is that? What is that called? What is Unity based on? It's based on something. It's the, Unity the, the, is an engine. On Unity. Yeah, that's what is I was it, is that Unity is an engine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, that's right, because Unity is is the um, the shooting game, like Doom and stuff was built on that. So it has that sort of background. No, kind you're of thing, thinking but. of Unreal Engine. Unreal. That's, see, never mind. I don't know what I'm talking about. Just kick me off the show now. <laughs> well, um, I, I was actually going to champion Roll20 as being the one people should use, but I think I agree with Eric um, about the Skype thing, if it's any temporary solution. But um, before we go, guys, let's plug let's plug ourselves. Eric. <laughs> Is this the point where we take our pants off? And- That's the one. Bend over, Gary. Okay. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get in my plug. Uh, yeah, what I podcast. We've been running this for five years now, a Savage Worlds podcast. We just changed format, shorter format. Episodes are 30 minutes or less. We got Gary with me and a new co-host, Carl Kiesler, Mr. Mr. All-Star. So we're, we're running a series on um, how to run great one shots and we take you through every step from concept to actually running it and everything in between so there's that and also just insert imagination wise guys came out last year we're still releasing stuff we just released a um a one sheet by john goff mr night train himself and look for for speaking of fantasy grounds, keep an eye on fantasy grounds. There might be a certain module for wise guys that comes out soon for fantasy grounds. So. Nice. Yeah, I mean, yeah, nice. uh, listeners of this show will know we bloody love wise guys. So go and go and check that out. And also all the other Justin Sir Imagination products like Punted and the Bonds, Whacked in the Wicket, Aliens vs. Rednecks, all those great ones. Aren't those all yours? Yeah. Tough guys. Oh, and tough guys. I forgot tough about guys. that. Dang it. Yeah. Gary, how about you? Plug, plug, plug yourself, Gary. What's what's going on with you? You've got a lot of stuff going on. Let me let me get my lube going on here. I don't have a lot of stuff going on. I have a lot of things that I that I do. Um, but if you want to learn about how to play on Tabletop Simulator, check out my uh, YouTube channel, Murder Hobo Show. And if you want to hear me and Uncle Jay talk about uh, bowel movements and uh, just basically problems being uh, old white men, uh, you can check out my podcast, Murder Hobo Show RPG, Murder Hobo RPG Show now. New format. Well, we're we're not a commercial like uh, the Wild Die podcast is. We actually we have some girth, some length to our show, right, Eric? <laughs> well, yeah. if by that you mean you're both quite large gentlemen, then you're right. <laughs> yeah, especially uh, the size of your nipples, chocolate chip mm-hmm. nipples. What are you Sausage talking? How do you know of- this? Huh? Yep. The naked news. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, the naked that's news right. Mean. I forgot about that. Yeah, they, they often strip down to do the news on their podcast, despite the fact that it's an audio medium. But I feel like it brings a different energy when these guys are <laughs> nude with each other. Right? The news is usually so boring, so you might as well do it naked. I've seen uh, Uncle Jay's weenus. I've seen his big sausage nipples, his peanut butter cra- uh, cracked crack. <laughs> okay, I think that's where we're going to leave it today, today, guys. That was a thank you guys for coming on. And just remember, the D20s are cool, but 20Ds, now that's a good time. Bye, everyone. Nice.